Hello, my name is PJ Lucky, and I serve as the Director of Student Diversity and Multicultural Affairs here at Fairfield University. I would like to welcome you to the Diversity in Action podcast. At Fairfield University, we embrace, support, and celebrate the unique characteristics of diverse identities and cultures. Fairfield University is committed to diversity in action. In honor of Black History Month, Today, our topic is unsung heroes. Joining us is an expert in black freedom struggle and urban history, associate professor of history and black studies, Dr. Shannon King. Welcome, Shannon. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Shannon, let's get right into it, man. Can you share a little bit about yourself, your hometown, you know, and maybe something that most people wouldn't know about you? Oh, my goodness. So, um, <laughs> So I'm a New Yorker and okay. I was raised in Harlem, um, New York. And I am, uh, what, what can I say? So raised in Harlem um, and the Bronx as well. Okay. Um, I, my first love is basketball. Really? Uh, yes, so. Are you a Knicks fan? <laughs> just say it, just say it if you I want. I am not. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a Knicks fan, um, really, but I grew up loving the Knicks okay. and the Yankees. Um, but, you know, I was always a Michael Jordan fan. Awesome, uh, awesome. You know, even when he was at, um, in college. So, awesome. but, so I guess one of the things that most folks probably don't know about me is that I was actually an artist. And I went to the fame school in New York City. Mm. Um, I was an art major. And, you know, many, many years ago, I wanted to um, uh, both write comic books and be the illustrator. Um, and so, Man. yeah, so, yeah, so, you know, you know, at the time, um, you know, you had a little bit of super friends and those kinds of things, nothing <laughs> like it is now, right? Um, of, you know mega um, billion dollar industry and in comic books and, and television and movies. Um, you know, at the time it was just the comic books. And so that was my, you know, one of my first loves. So yeah, comic books, um, okay. basketball and Kung Fu movies. So I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I, I watch some Kung Fu movies every now and then also. <laughs> awesome. Well, you know, Shannon, can you share with us, you know, any unsung hero whose journey has really affected or influenced your life um, and the work that you do today? So I think I want to talk about two people. Um, the first is Ida B. Wells, um, and the second is Ella Baker. Um, and so Ida B. Wells um, was born in Holy Springs, Mississippi, but she's better known for her work um, in Tennessee. And so Ida B. Wells was a journalist. She was a freedom fighter. And uh, she's one of the first individuals who began to really put anti-lynching um, campaigns on the map, both nationally and internationally. And so I think it's important to sort of think about, um, you know, one, obviously she's a black woman, but two, um, if we were to center her history, right, um, then we might, have a, a deeper appreciation and an understanding of um, the relationship between um, the, the more recent movement for Black Lives and this very long history of Black efforts to reduce um, anti-Black violence, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a clear line between um, the work of Ida B. Wells and you know, what's going on um, or what has been going on um, in terms of movement mobilization over the last, um, uh, let's say since 2012 with Trayvon Martin and, and then more recently um, this summer with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, for example. And so, you know, it's important to sort of think about um, uh, not only that, you know, she's a black woman and we can identify this long history, but also that she was connected to you know, various movements that included um, other folks. So we could certainly identify her as a Southerner. We can identify mm -hmm. her as a journalist. 
we can identify particular issues um, that that are, are important for us to sort of understand um, um, this long struggle, but we can also sort of identify her as connected to the founding of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1909. Um, we can also identify her as an individual um, who was also a black feminist. So a lot of the different issues that seem relevant today, we can use her, for example, and others, but we could use her and go back, you know, more than 100 years. Um, and so I think it's sort of really important for people to think about um, this much longer history that sometimes we might limit to um, the 1960s and MLK or Martin Luther King was really, really important, but we could sort of go much further back and we can also identify black people, black women who have been central um, and, and continue to be central to these movements. So that's one individual that, that you know, I think it's important for us to learn a little bit about. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ida B. Wells, man, man. Yes. I mean, I, I knew she was one of the co-founders of the NAACP, but yeah. uh, I, I didn't realize she was so connected to the anti-lynch movement. Yeah. That's amazing. So let me, actually, I have a quote for you um, awesome. that, you know, I wanted to read and sort of riff on it a little bit and, and sort mm -hmm. of connections. And so she wrote a pamphlet um, and was published in 1892, and it's called Southern Horrors and Other Writings. Um, and so... Uh, she writes, quote, a Winchester rifle should have a place of honor in every black home. It should be used for the protection which the law refuses to give. When the white man who is always the aggressor knows he runs as great a risk of biting the dust every time his Afro-American friend does, he will have greater respect for Afro-American life. So that's a, you know, an interesting quote for several reasons. Um, and, and, and one of which um, is because, you know, we tend to think about um, um, nonviolence and self-defense or using the gun as really opposite um, kinds of, of, of civil rights struggle, right? And, and mm -hmm. generally it's uh, Malcolm X as mm -hmm. the sort of self-defense self guy and then there's the Martin Luther King as the nonviolence person. And so I think if, again, if we move further back and we think about this question of lynchings, several things emerge out of um, this quote. One is that she's talking about self-defense, right? Yeah. And in centering self-defense, she's actually talking about pr the preservation of black people, right? right? Like she's literally saying black lives matter. The other point that she's really making um, is that um, oftentimes, especially in the cases of lynchings, um, that African-Americans did not receive the protection of the police, right? And so yes. part of the reason why it's important to sort of talk about self-defense is the absence of protection of black people, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so that becomes an important sort of way to think about um, you know, these questions with policing and white mobs and the like during the lynching era. And then finally, I think it's really important it's because she's also arguing that I will protect myself. My goal isn't to harm you, but if you harm mm -hmm. me, I will, you know, return um, with, you know, the same kind of violence that you, you direct, in my, uh, direct at me, right? And so I think that's also important because it sort of, it, it thinks about how do we talk about not only self-defense mm -hmm. in terms of how black people um, use it as a particular strategy, but it also forces us to engage in white violence, right? I mean, it centers white violence in the way that we often forget when we have these binary uh, Martin Luther King or Malcolm X, we forget that white folks either through the police or white mobs who are also engaging in the violence. So, so she's really important as an individual, as a black woman, um, as an activist, as a journalist um, who you know, put these issues on the table. And I think that if we were to sort of reread Southern Horrors, um, it would help us sort of think about how these aren't issues that you know, came about um, during the Obama administration and, and, and the Trump administration, but these are actually issues that go much deeper 
um, and farther in American history. You know, Shannon, that, that's very interesting that you say that when you mentioned uh, not being protected back in her time, I mean, I, I went to thinking, I mean, a, a police officer during that time could have been part of the KKK, right. you know, it, it, yeah. more likely than not, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah. as I as I think about it, I think about the generations that came after, and it seemed like generations were still socialized to have a bias against people of color. Right. Um, and I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts on, you know, even I would say, I guess the the progression of our society in mm -hmm. how we've broken that bias or, or has it been less? Do you think that we've actually made a strong stand? I know I'm going a little bit off topic to Unsung Heroes, no, but no, that's perfectly fine. I mean, no, I mean, I think these are all important questions because, you know, part of her part of what Southern Horrors does as a pamphlet, um, you know, is what, um, you know, folks like you and others are doing, right? You're trying to use your voice and your platform to create a situation in, where, in, in which there's more understanding. And certainly I pulled this quote out, um, but it's only one quote out of a longer pamphlet, right? Which really talked more broadly about um, the ways in which um, violence was framed in ways that, that, it, that blamed Black people for the violence that they received, right? And so I think to, to get to your question, I do think that, that there are you know, always improvements. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's also important to, to lay out that even at that time, there were various voices, right? The white community um, has never been um, homogenous in, in so far as one could never say that all white people uh, had a, a particular viewpoint. At the same time, mm -hmm. you can say the same thing for African-Americans, right? And so part of identifying her is to identify that you have this particular voice um, who had a particular analysis about um, questions of gender and politics and voting, um, and in particular, the questions around violence in terms of lynchings. And so, yeah, I would say that there's been some progression, but I also think that, you know, these things are really complicated um, and that these ideas and values go back to you know, the 17th century. And, you know, um, you know, if we think about the 1619 project, I mean, that's a very, very long time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, those, so those ideas about black people being inferior or black people not deserving to be first-class citizens or questions around civil rights, et cetera, are sort of hard to iron out. And, and um, you know, uh, uh, time doesn't always heal. Um, often because um, some white folks continue to have those views and they also create conditions for those, for those views to flourish in ways that can convince these next generations that those views are legitimate, right? And so you have this push and pull um, of forces that are anti-Black um, and then forces that are, you know, um, about, you know, the humanity, embracing the humanity of Black people and those forces mm -hmm are not just black folks, they're white folks, they're Asian folks and Latinx folks, et cetera, right? So there's always been a diversity of people who, who advocate for the, the human rights of black folks. Um, but at the same time, um, it's important to understand that, you know, these ideas don't sort of evaporate from nowhere. There are people who are engaging in activities, support policies, et cetera, that sort of reinforce <laughs> ideas about inequality and black subjugation you know you brought up some some things that I, I think about often you talked about black folks feeling inferior at times and I actually I happened to skim through your book um you know whose Harlem is it anyway and there were some folks that I that I read about in your book that I've never heard of right. um specifically uh Philip Payton and uh John Neal John Nail excuse me and uh -huh. uh, Harry Parker uh -huh. Some some black entrepreneurs that I've never heard of in my entire life, right, and, I, right. and I, after reading through your book, I, I was inspired to do some more research. Right, um, right. But it seems like they actually were around around the same time as Ida B. Wells, if I'm correct. Is, is that yeah. the same time period? Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, but I'm just wondering, can you expound upon? Uh, and again, I know you have someone else that I, I definitely want to hear about. Right. But you know, 
maybe some of those folks, some of those entrepreneurs that many of us have never heard of. Right. I mean, and these guys, from what I understand, owned hundreds of real estate properties sure. um, in the New York area, and people have never heard of this. Right. Well, and, yeah, I mean, I think, I think there is a long history of Black business owners and Black entrepreneurialism. And I think it's hard to, to hear about them as individuals unless you um, are from New York City or you're interested in New York history, right? Mm -hmm. um, and th these kind of individuals you will find in every city, right? Um, so whether it's Chicago, um, whether it's Durham, North Carolina, for example, right? Um, you know, you will always find Black entrepreneurs. And so really, you know, those individuals were often the people who were migrants. Um, in some cases, let's say in a place like a Durham, they may have come from rural parts of North Carolina to the city. Um, if they're moving to New York City, for example, they're all coming from the South. Some of them came from the Caribbean, the British and Caribbean, for example. Some of them were Puerto Ricans, right? Coming from Puerto Rico. So there's always been a, a really robust migration of, of, of Black people um, who were entrepreneurs um, and who really battled, in, in the case of Neil and, and others, sort of battled with white realtors to provide um, affordable homes for African Americans, right? Um, and so, you know, those are interesting stories. The way I write about it in the book, um, identifies this idea around notions of community, right? Mm. Um, and, in, and, and one of the, the foundational ways to do that is to create um, buildings, right? Um, and create institutions. And so usually um, when the houses came, the apartments and the buildings came, then the churches came, right? And then with the churches come, other institutions are built whether they're stores, whether they're theaters and the like, right? If initially you need the homes and eventually you sort of branch out and sort of, and sort of get these, um, um, and, and get these sort of communities that become important um, within the context of, you know, um, white realtors trying to um, reduce, right? Um, African Americans' ability to to move in, um, and so that was always a struggle. Um, and the other part was that a lot of these realtors um, had initially worked for, you know, um, work with white business owners um, or white property owners who were, you know, invested in in some ways in getting um, uh, some of the white uh, tenants out because it was. Uh, more expensive to, um, you could easily uh, 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 charge black folks higher rents, and so there's that mm -hmm. part. Um, you know, I don't, I don't tend to um, uh, uh, identify those folks um, because I think they are readily available, right? In, in terms of you know black entrepreneurs and the like, and I think those stories are important, um, but I think that those stories. Um, uh, sort of paint a picture that might leave out black women, for example, right? Awesome, awesome. So, understandable. So for me, it's important to sort of center um, not only black women, but also center black women who we could easily connect with the present, right? Because I, I do think yes, that um, we tend to act as if um, black women have only recently become important. And so I think for some younger generations, it's important for them to learn that actually, I mean, we can sort of talk about Michelle Obama and others now, um, um, but black women have, you know, been magnificent and beautiful and important for generations. Um, yes, sir. And they have been at the center of, you know, our social movements from the very beginning. So, yeah. You know, Shannon, you're, you're so right. I know I mentioned to to many folks that I've worked with in the past. I, I talk about Rosa Parks sometimes, right? Um, and so many times people just think about Rosa Parks was the woman that sat on the bus, right? Right, and that's all she did. Right. But what made it so significant, and you kind of hinted toward 
uh, when you mentioned community, she mm-hmm. was a pillar in her community when right. it came to service and what she was doing, because before her, there were other black women that sat on the bus and right. got arrested. Right. Um, but Rosa in particularly, I mean, again, it, it was much more than her just saying, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get off the bus right now or move to another seat. Right. It was because of her character and who she was and how invested she was within her community and the work that she was already doing for the movement, correct? Exactly. Yeah, so I mean, you know, the story about Rosa Parks is important and it also provide a, a nice headway to talk about Ella Baker. I mean, so people forget or don't realize that, you know, Rosa Parks was actually the secretary of the Montgomery um, NAACP, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so she was well aware of and prepared for and had engaged for you know, decades in different kinds of civil rights struggles. Um, And so I often joke with my students because we tend to um, describe her as this elderly woman who was, who was actually, I think in her late thirties. Now I'm in my late forties. And so I remind (laughs) my students that I'm actually older than who, uh, you know, than than Rosa Parks was. So let let me sort of segue and talk a little bit about Ella Baker. Um, So Ella Baker, is important too because she's she she is certainly connected um, to Ida B. Wells in some interesting ways, but for different reasons. And so, if we think about Ida B. Wells, the the the, the um, sort of anti lynching um, leader in the 19th and early 20th century, we could sort of identify uh, Ella Baker as this individual who, uh, in many ways. Um, from you know the 20s, the 1920s um, to the 1980s, was this um, important civil rights leader, who you know one might identify as a bridge leader. Um, when I use the mm-hmm. language of bridge leader, I mean an individual who participated in various movements um, and who carried um, their ideas, their activism, their social networks from one social movement to the next, right? And so, for example, if we think about Ella Baker um, from Virginia, North Carolina, um, who eventually moves to Harlem in the early 20s, in the late 20s, rather, and participates in all kinds of movements. Um, and then she works for the NAACP, the National Association for Advancing Colored People. She works for the National Urban League. She works for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. In fact, she was, um, I, think the, I think, the executive secretary there with Martin Luther King. And so she's an important individual who had all this experience well before um, anyone was thinking about a Martin Luther King. Um, And so she's this individual, and I wanted to read a quote from her and then then I'll say a little bit more about her. She's an individual who centered the community and people um, in ways that has always um, um, touched me and help me think about not only how I see the world and how I want to engage it, but also, you know, how I see my work. Um, one of the, the concepts that I use in my book is community politics. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that becomes an important way to think about um, not only the individual, but the individual's relationship to the, the, the broader community. And so one quote she, she has, um, my basic sense of it Uh, leadership has always been to get people to understand that in the long run, they themselves are the only protection they have against violence or injustice. And so that's an important quote to me because that helps us think about um, how do we engage these questions of social justice or violence? Um, Do we rely on politicians? Do we rely on leaders? It also forces us to say, well, Perhaps, but we also have to think about what role do we play? How are we responsible and accountable for these situations? Another quote um, is, I have always thought what is needed is the development of people who are interested not in being leaders as much as in developing leadership in others, right? And so that becomes important because, again, if the goal, if you have you know, knowledge that you can share with other people, the question becomes, why is that knowledge important to you? Is it important mm-hmm. for you to sort of use it to say, hey, I have this knowledge and I want to market it and I want more people to listen to me? Or is it, I have this knowledge and I want to share it 
And I want to spread it in ways that it can help other people do the things that they feel like they need to do, right? And so that's always been sort of my, my approach to things. And so she becomes important um, because she's the individual who helps um, shepherd um, this younger crop of, of, of civil rights activists who are part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, better known as SNCC. Um, and SNCC becomes really important because they're the ones along with King, but in particular SNCC, they're the ones who are playing this huge role during the 60s um, in voter registration and in various forms of mobilization. Um, and they're the ones who, unlike King, are working not only in the urban areas, but particularly the rural areas where it's much more Same. violent. Um, and so I think it's important to think about um, Ella Baker because she's this person who, who who, whether it's the 20s, which is the period I read about, or the 40s, 50s, and 60s, she's able mm -hmm. to carry all this knowledge forth, so much so that when we think about the Black Lives Matter movement now, a lot of their ideas about how to organize movements, how to think about and conceptualize them, come from an Ella Baker, right? They're tapping directly into the ideas of the Suit and Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which tried to um, create a, a democracy um, within their organization and not have a, a hierarchical um, organization in ways that put, put mainly men in, in control, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think this is important as an important link for, um, for folks um, to get a sense of, wow, we can sort of connect um, what's going on now, um, you know, as we, you know, um, watch the television and we see a lot of these black women leaders, we can identify these two black women, Ida B. Wells, Ella Baker, who are doing all these things. And we can sort of have a sense of um, people to tap into, mm -hmm. not only, you know, the, the women in, in the present, but not, but their relationship to the women in the past. Um, and that, you know, the, a lot of these um, younger activists and, and black women and the politicians and others are standing on the shoulders of these two women. Awesome. Awesome, man. Well, <laughs> Shannon, man, thank you for that, man. <laughs> Can I audit your class? Of course. <laughs> well, you know, Shannon, with, with that said, uh, is there anyone you would encourage folks to research um, mm -hmm. that would really enlighten them around this work? Uh, I know you just mentioned uh, two extraordinary folks, uh, mm -hmm. but really, I mean, maybe someone more recent. Is there any unsung leaders that you're following now that folks should look into to become more aware um, and embody the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion? I mean, um, you know, one of the people who, who um, I, I'm watching closely is Kianga Yamada Taylor. Okay. Um, she um, teaches at Princeton University. Um, and she is a scholar activist. Um, and she writes for The New Yorker. Um, mm -hmm. And she, and I can't remember the exact title of her book, um, but I think the book is called, she has several books, but one of them is called, um, I think from Black Power to Black, from, hashtag Black Power to Black Liberation. Mm -hmm. And so um, in the tradition of, a, of, of um, Ida B. Wells, she writes, she has, she's most well known for um, her work around the Black Lives Matter movement, um, not only as a scholar activist, but an individual um, who comes from a tradition um, of activism, in particular as a teenager and as a young adult, you know, she was in, she participated um, in movements around equitable and fair housing, for example. Right, and so a lot of her ideas and her politics come out of her own experiences as a young activist, um, you know, fighting for the rights of tenants and homeowners. Um, and so I think it's important to, you know, especially for, for young folks who are interested in becoming academics, um, you know, you can live a life before you go get your PhD or whatever degree that you want. Um, and that, you know, I, that's something I wish that I did, that I was more involved um, in more movement forms of activism 
than the more scholarly angle. But yeah, Kiaga Yamada Tail is, is one individual that folks can, can look up um, uh, and, and follow her work. I mean, she writes uh, regularly for the New Yorker if you want some of her more popular writings. Um, and so she, um, she also has an academic book called Race for Profit, which is actually about housing um, mm -hmm. and it comes partly out of her own activism as a younger activist. Um, and then the more popular hashtag Black Power to Black Liberation is um, the more popular work that most, uh, most folks have likely read if they know anything about her. Um, and I think she also has a, um, a, a, a book of interviews. Um, is, I think it's, it might be How Do We Get Free? Um, but it's a book of interviews with the founders of the Kambahi River Collective. Um, okay. A black women, um, uh, feminists. Um, oh my God, I should know the dates, but I can't. I can't recall. I think it's the the late sixties, early. It, it might be the early seventies, in the Kambahi River Collective. No, it, see, I can't even remember. Um, okay. But folks can look it up, and so um, you know, the the Kambahi River Collective was important because it was foundational, and 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 in particular. Um, they help us sort of think about what now some, what, what some people would call identity politics, although that's a whole mm. other conversation because people yes, miss Um But anyway, so I'll stop there. I mean, so yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't know you were going to ask me that, but yeah, I, I, I would say uh, Keanu Yamada Taylor is an imp important person to sort of check out. Um, and whether, you know, whether it's her books, whether it's, um, you can find her on YouTube, you can find a popular reading, but yeah, she's an important person, I think, who's, um, who has a clear analysis of what's going on in the world currently. Okay. And, you know, just to, just to bring us back to the topic for today is unsung heroes of Black history. Mm -hmm. Can you define what an unsung hero means to you and why you believe so many folks have been overlooked? That's a that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, it's to ask a historian that question is such a complicated question. Um, you know, the quick answer is the easy answer is is that you know I think it's hard to um, identify all these important people, and I I do think that identifying heroes. Um, has a lot to do with who has the power to pick them, right? Um, and so I think that's, you know, identifying heroes and unsung heroes and alike is really about power dynamics, who has um, the authority and voice to do that. But also it has a lot to do with what's your particular ideology, right? Um, and how you see the world. Um, and so for example, if we think about the folks that you identified, I mean, you know, I think entre black entrepreneurialism is so important um, because it, 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 it sort of changes that, that, that dynamic from black people asking others to do for them to how black people have done for themselves. Um, and so that's important. Um, and so at the same time, you know, that's also connected to, you know, Ida B. Wells and, um, and Ella Baker um, in particular, Ella Baker, who believed in um, cooperatives, for example. Um, and so instead of an entrepreneur, she was more interested in groups of people creating a cooperative and they're owning it together, right? Which is sort mm. of similar, but different from the, the individual entrepreneur who owns the building and trying to make yes, money. Sir. She was more interested in, let's say, 12 of us putting in our money, we own it together. Um, and we can provide more for the community, for example. Um, so, I mean, you know, again, that, that's probably not a good answer, but, you know, but yeah, I, you know, <laughs> un unsung heroes, I would define are individuals who I think are important to um, how we envision society um, and people who have attempted to um, bring about that vision for us. And so certainly for me, um, Ella Baker and Ida B. Wells, um, we're interested in a society where Black people are safe and we're treated equally. Um, and so, um, yeah, 
but yeah, I'll stop there. You know, you mentioned co cooperatives, correct? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, for Ella Baker, w was she able to actually get some of those things going at all? I, I mean, I'm sure we can do more research. But I'm just wondering. Well, yeah, I mean, in the in the in, in the in the late 20s and early 30s, she was involved. She and others, um, uh, and lots of Black folks. And in, in in this case, this is Harlem. She was in Harlem, New York at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they were able to do some of that work. Now they were also doing it in the midst of the Great Depression. And so it made sense to think about a more collective effort um, because poverty was so widespread and, um, and um, the New Deal, while it did uplift some people out of poverty, it, it didn't go as far as it needed to do. Um, so yeah, I mean, she was able to do that, but no, the Great Depression was much stronger and greater than um, anything individuals could do, um, you know. And so, the, you know, again, if we sort of think about our current situation, it's similar to black um, and brown businesses trying mm -hmm. to stay open now within the context of sort of this incredible pandemic. Um, that has, you know, beat up the economy, you know, so yes, you know, we need um, the federal government to intervene in ways to help out all Americans and especially, you know, businesses. Um, but yeah, I mean, th there, there was some, you know, good efforts, but not in, in such a way where it could have a significant impact um, over, over the long haul. Yeah. Yes, sir. You know, I, I'm all about teamwork. That, the cooperatives sound great. Seriously. I, I mean, I, to me, that, that really, makes community and it, 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 it's right. I feel like serving together and working together really yeah. brings folks closer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean that, you know, that's what co-ops are. I mean, that's, that's essentially what, um, you know, a lot of people are involved in and engaged in. Um, her, hers was a little different in so far as that it wasn't just about providing homes, but it was also grocery stores, like a much broader, um, mm. more social oriented, um, effort that had more to do with a social justice approach rather than just providing housing. Um, but awesome. housing is also part of it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Dr. Shannon King, we like to end on something sweet. So we ask all of our guests, what's your favorite candy? <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, unfortunately, I can't, <laughs> I can't think of a favorite candy because I can't have sugar. Um, yes. Oh, man. No. yeah, man, old age and health and, you know, I don't, I don't eat sugar anymore. Um, we can, we can go fruit then. Cause it's about ending on something sweet. Um, oh my God. So what do I like? I don't even know. I mean, I'm a berries person. So strawberries okay. berries. and usually it's not one it's they're usually together. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> You know, um, and I put them in my smoothie. So that's <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I, I do something very similar. I buy the berry mix and and, and make my smoothies with that also. <laughs> that's, that's that's the way to go. So yeah. So you know. So you know, you brought something great too. You know, we got to make sure we're staying healthy out here. That's right. So, uh, that's you right. You know, less candy, more smoothies. <laughs> yes, more smoothies, and you know, throw something green in there, and you know. Yes, sir some protein mix but anyway you didn't ask for all that sorry <laughs> <laughs> well dr shannon king thank you so much for taking the time to join us and for those of us joining us at home thank you for watching i'm pj lucky and this is diversity in action <laughs>